Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Is It Really Worth It podcast. First of all, we've got a great pod today, but I'd like to start by saying thank you very much to our sponsors, S&D Paving for your construction, civil engineering, traffic management and tarmac. I would also like to thank Crystal Motors for all of your transport requirements. Today we have a legend. Um, it could be a pretty, pretty long intro. So we've got Big Joe Egan, seven times Irish champion, sparring partner to the world's greatest fighters and personally a great friend. How are you Joe? Sean, thank you very much. Before we even start, I was speaking to a two-time champion of the world today, Paul Silky Jones. Silky. I think there was a time you and him were going to fight. Uh, is I both. Uh, I was looking at Paul. Yeah, yeah. he was the British champion. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Cause we were talking about it today. He sends his very best regards, and he wants to come on your podcast. Ah, oh, he's got a book mate. coming out. He's got a book coming out soon, and he sends his very best regards. What a fire! Incredible. He knocked, out, he knocked out two of my pals. He knocked out, he knocked out Damien Denny for the title. That's a good fighter. Great fighter. Yeah. He knocked out Damien Denny. Then he beat um, did he fight Antonio him? Fernandez. He beat yeah, Antonio. Did he, he beat fight Antonio. Andy, Andy Story as well? Did he fight? No, he beat, uh, he, beat, uh, he, beat, he beat another friend of mine over 12 rounds, Danny Juma. He beat Juma over 12 rounds. He beat a few friends of mine. Yeah, silky, yeah. smooth. Incredible, incredible yeah. fighter. Very Great smooth. Fighter. Light middle and middleweight champion. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, let's get down to it's Joe Egan. Egan. <laughs> right, Joe, probably one of Ireland's greatest exports. Oh, thank you, Sean. But where did it all begin? I started boxing when I was nine years of age. We talk about exports. Ireland's greatest export has always been its people, Sean. Yeah. And my dad came over to the UK to work from Ireland. Left my mother with seven children. I'm the eldest of seven. I got four sisters and two younger brothers four younger sisters and two younger brothers. But my dad couldn't provide for us in Ireland because there was no work for him. So he came to the UK like a lot of the Irish. It was in the 60s, Joe? Yes. Yeah. And I was born in 1965. So um, he came to the UK to work, send the money home, as yeah. the Irish always do, to try and better the lives of the ones that had to leave behind. We used to come and visit him, you know, different parts of the UK this particular time we came to visit him in London, I was nine, and I'd been getting bullied. I'd had some horrific bullying. That back in Ireland you're getting bullied? No, I actually got bullied for the first time in Manchester when I was seven or eight years of age. We visited my dad in Manchester before we came to London to visit him. And I was making my Holy Communion in Manchester, Sean. I had my Holy Communion medal on my waistcoat. And two of the, I was seven or eight, two of the big bully boys were 15 or 16 tried to take my Holy Communion medal and when I, when I protected my medal, I exposed my two front teeth and they knocked out my two front teeth, Sean. All my years boxing, I only ever had one tooth knocked out, then Roy Bryan knocked that out in uh, round one. And um, good punch that was. <laughs> my head spun, it was like an exorcism, <laughs> sure. But, uh, you always remember the video. Oh, I held my tooth in my mouth with a mouth full of blood. Because I didn't want to spin it out in front of the referee. I knew it had been busted. Yeah. Because I felt the power and the impact of the punch. Yeah. So I held, I held it in my mouth, trying to breathe through my nose. <clears throat> when I got back to my corner, I put my head in my bucket, spit bucket, and I spat out a mouthful of blood. And my tooth was spinning. <laughs> went around the bucket swimming. <laughs> it wasn't a nice sight. This was the end of round one. I thought I got several more of these. <laughs> But the fight was actually stopped in round five. I lost that fight, Sean. I got stopped on cuts. I got 64 stitches after the fight. It was a bloodbath of a fight. And uh, I was winning the fight as well. It happens in boxing. No right. disrespect for the man, he got a win over me. But the day I got my two front teeth knocked down in Manchester was a horrible day, Sean. Anyway, uh, I got bullied in the UK because I had the Irish accent. Yeah. So I picked up the English accent. So I could mix in. When I went home to Dublin, I got bullied in Dublin because I did. Picking accent. up the English, yeah. yeah. So my dad encouraged us when I came to visit him in London because I'd spoken to him about getting bullied. 
and my younger brothers and sisters tried to protect them because I was the man of the house. Well, I was just going to get there, Joe, was the being man of the, the oldest of seven children, yeah. especially in Irish families. I'm not, I'm not You've a lot of responsibility. Um, I'm not going to go Anyway, yeah, I was, the, I was the man of the house. So when, when we came to visit him in London, I explained to him what was happening with the bullying. And he brought us down to a boxing gym, Earlsfield Amateur Boxing Gym on Gareth Lane. Frank Greer had actually boxed for the gym as a kid. And there were some lovely, lovely people in the gym. Keith Druitt, Mick, Mr. Pamenta, Dougie. There were some lovely, these were the trainers of the gym. Yeah. And some of the fighters, Patrick Pasley, Lenny and Alan Jackson. So just, just go back a bit, Joe. How did you find, or how did boxing find you? Well, that's, that's the reason why, Sean, because I was getting bullied and Dad, Dad wasn't there to, to protect us because he was away working. So he encouraged us to box, me and my two brothers, he encouraged us to box to learn how to defend ourselves. And if you talk to most boxers, nine out of ten of the stories are similar From because of bullying. Yeah. No one likes a bully, Sean. I, I hate bullies yeah. with a passion. I've been bullied as a child and I've been bullied as an adult. And I, I, I'd stand, I'd stand and, and, and I'll fight Sean. Even when I was getting beaten as a child, I still felt. Yeah. I've always had an abundance of courage, Sean. And I think all fighters are born with that courage. Anyone steps through them. You can, you can teach them skills to fight, but if they haven't got the courage to fight, they go and play football, they play golf, they play tennis, they play basketball. You don't play I fighting, no. not just boxing. Whether it be a cage fight, MMA, Jiu Jitsu, Karate, you know, kickboxing, any form of fighting. We're warriors, Sean. We are I'm modern playing. day gladiators, male and female. And they are born with courage. And that's one thing I've always had, Sean, like I said, I was born with. Like all fighters, was courage. Didn't have much skills. But I used to stand on the ground with the bully boys. Yeah. And when they finished beating on me, Rather than hit my brothers and sisters, I used to jump back in and say, hit me more. And I got to the stage where I could absorb punishment like a sponge, Sean. I could just take it. I've been hit with everything from baseball bats to scaffolding poles to two by fours. I've been hit, I've been hit with boots, kicks, headbutts, butts, everything. You know, I've been shot twice, Sean. So I've been hit with lead, you know. I've had, I've had a lot of pain inflicted on this body. The boxing ring, Sean, was actually quite safe for me. It is a safe Because there's one man hitting you. Yeah. You've got a referee Protects that helps you yeah. if you're in trouble. Yeah. You've got a break in between rounds. You've got the best of medical care at ringside. Yeah. You know, you've got a bit of respite in between rounds as well. And if, if you're in trouble, the towel can come in if you're in severe trouble. You've got the best people all around you. I didn't have that luxury when I was getting battered by the bullies and beaten to a pulp by the bullies. If I made it home, if I made it home, it was a bit of a safe haven. You could close your front door, Sean. Sadly, today, that safe haven seems to be gone because the youth today that are getting bullied seem to be getting bullied over mobile phones yeah. and seem to be getting bullied over the internet. Now, it's physical, bullying, physical injuries, there's a time scale to heal, Sean. Yeah, and it's right? pretty quick. I get a broken nose, broken jaw, broken arm, broken leg, whatever they break. Six they will break something. Yeah, yeah. The doctor will tell you more or less to the day when you're going to heal. See, mental bullying, mental torture, Lifetime. there's no time scale of the healing. And I see some people today, they never get over it. And sadly, they take their lives because of bullying. You hear this, oh, it's peer pressure. It's far from peer pressure, Sean. I had peer pressure when I was a child growing up trying to impress my dad. Yeah. To understand, we all want to impress our dads. We all want to impress our mums. You know, so I had pressure, but never to the point of where I'd want to take my life, life Sean. Yeah. You know, so this lame excuse, oh, it's peer pressure. No, it's not. It's bullying. These people are taking their lives today because of bullying. It's got the stuff. Yeah. I try my best to stand up for anti-bullying campaigns. You know, I, I put myself out there, Sean, to help as many as I possibly can. Yeah. And if I can stop one person from being bullied, He's done a job. I've done a good job, You've Sean. done a job, You've yeah, proper a job. job, you know. So, the boxing started? Well, Earlsfield. Yeah, Earlsfield Club. And then when we came back over to Dublin, I went to 
My dad's old amateur boxing club, Corinthians, but their club had been burnt down and they were using St. Saviour's Boxing Club, um, which, which was ram-packed because there was two boxing clubs using the one uh, venue yeah. and it was rammed and um, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, comfortable yeah. as a kid to be sort of crammed in. Yeah. So we went to the North Boxing Club, a friend of the family, Jerry Burney at the local fruit and veg shop in Rings End. He said there's a, a good club, Tony Mann, Benny Bracken. They've turned out many, many champions. Paddy Finn was the, was the Irish heavyweight champion when I joined the club and I used to look at him with, oh, I wanted to emulate him being the Irish heavyweight champion. Paddy, Paddy, Paddy. Paddy. But yeah, yeah, where yeah. he was from, don't yes, remember, he, yeah. he came over to Birmingham when he went professional. And uh, I used to look at him and, and oh, he was the Irish heavyweight champion. I used to say, I want to emulate him one day. I wanted to be the Irish heavyweight champion. But there were so many champions in the North Boxing Club, the Ormonds, great boxing family. You know, so you're in your first amateur boxing club, your first fight, was that in Phoenix Club? Yes, I was uh, 11 years of age and uh, I, was, I was a little fat kid, sure. I've always struggled with my weight, you know, and um, I like my food. People ask me what my favourite meal is, I always tell them it's seconds. That's, <laughs> my, that's my favourite meal, you know, yeah. but uh, I do love, I do love my grub. So when I got to, to Phoenix Boxing Club, I'm standing outside the club and I'm talking to a good friend of mine that, that I've known from a kid called Skinner Evans, Richard Evans, Richard Skinner Evans. And he's got a lad standing beside him and his name was Steve Collins. Didn't look my weight, but because he was a year and a half older than me, they allowed us to box. Right. So I'm chatting to him outside. Not so your like first it. amateur fight yes. was Steve Collins? Was Steve Collins, yeah. <laughs> he schooled me. He schooled me, Sean. He schooled me, gave me a, a, a good beating, but he was a year and a half older than me. He was lighter than me, but he's a year and a half older than me. And at 11 years of age, that year and a half makes a big difference. Massive difference. The referee was a man called Mr. Brannigan, Lugs Brannigan, because of his big ears. And he was an Irish police officer, a guy the sheer corner, and he was as hard as nails. He used to say he was a one-man riot squad. <laughs> so when I was getting battered in round one, I went back to my corner, 11 years of age, Sean, and my corner man, Said, we're going to retire you, John. I said, I'm not retiring on my stool. No chance. I can, I can fight on. Even at 11, even at 11, she wouldn't have that. DNA. DNA. Yeah. You know, and I got up off my stool. I thought the referee stops it. The referee stops it. I went out for round two, got battered again in round two by Steve Collins. Came back. I hadn't got a chance against him. The man went on to win two world titles middleweight and super middleweight champion of the world. You know, he was an incredible fighter, even as a boy. Brilliant fighter. Even as a boy, he was brilliant. Yeah. We're still friends to this day. I've done a show with him in Leeds two weeks ago. Me, Derek Roach, Jim Rock, Steve Collins. You know, there was four great Irish champions on the top stage together. But anyway, let's go back to the... He beat me back then. Lost on points. He beat me again when I was 16. Not as bad a beating. Different weights, obviously, different yeah, weights. Yeah, we were, we, we were, we were so youth heavyweights. Youth heavyweights. Right. Your class as a youth heavyweight. So, so Steve sort of, was a heavyweight as a youth. Youth, youth yeah. But it's a big window as yeah. a youth, you know. It's not like as a senior. There's I don't think you can get to fucking super middle then. <laughs> he, was, uh, he was a muscular yeah, he was a man. big, he was a very, very, young very man, big, you know? yeah. And uh, he was an incredibly powerful young man as well, you know, because he yeah. could punch. But um, when he went pro, he found his suitable weight at middleweight. Well, Steve went over to the Petronellis, didn't he? We went to the Petronellis, he lost. His first world title attempt was against Mike, Mike McCallum. McCallum. What a fight. And I think fight. that was a, a lot yeah. closer than what Yeah. Is. And then his second world title loss was against Reggie Johnson. Both distance losses. Then he lost to Sumbu Kalambu for a European, Sumbu Kalambu for a European title. Another when he was fight. learning in America. Yeah. Sparring with marvellous, marvellous Marvin Hagler, yeah. sparring with all these great fighters, being trained by different trainers, Freddie Roach, you know, was just one, Emmanuel Stewart, another, picking up skills and tactics from different trainers. Yeah. See, when he came to the UK, he came to uh, England when he fought Nigel Benn and Chris Eubanks, he was the finished product, he was the real and deal. And he beat two of Britain's finest ever champions. Chris One Pye, of my favourite. Chris Pye, knockout. Listen, he beat Pye for the middleweight title, which Lock, was an incredible. Long medal. 
No, the middleweight title. Oh, it was the middle. The middleweight title. Super, super middle, middle, yeah. second, yeah, it was. Yeah. Because Chris Wilde was the right middle and the middle. Yeah. He beat Peter for the middleweight title. That's right, it was middleweight. And uh, when uh, when he beat Nigel Ben and Chris Eubanks, I love both of them, Eubanks and Ben. Because yeah. two great warriors. I love all fighters, Sean. Yeah. Whoa. I love the fighters. Mm. Well, yeah. well, one big family. Yeah. The respect that fighters have around the world is incredible. Boxing gives you first and foremost self-respect and respect for your opponent or the fighters. It's the most cosmopolitan sport in the world. You can go anywhere in the world, they might not be kicking a soccer ball, they might not be bouncing a basketball, yeah, but the there'll be a kid punching a bag. Yeah. Four corners of the earth. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the best sport, maybe we're biased because we're ex-fighters, but to me it's the best sport in the world. Because if you can walk that walk into a boxing ring to fight, nothing in life will face you. Nah, nothing. 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 It's the best feeling in the world when you get your own way. So you lose a draw with a good feeling anyway. Joe. So, so once your amateur career started picking up now, yeah. because your amateur career was phenomenal, a great and a good amateur career, sure. Yeah, 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 four great champions. But people's attitudes to you, i.e. the bullies. Did that change as your career started to grow? I've always enjoyed, I've always enjoyed my boxing show. Even in the hard fights, I enjoyed them. Even fights that I lost. I used to do a Muhammad Ali shuffle because I idolised Muhammad Ali. To me, he wasn't just the greatest man to enter a boxing ring. He's one of the greatest men to enter the world. The world, yeah. was privileged yeah. to have him. So I always had fun. And people were drawn to me because I was a character because I say there's thousands of languages in the world. We all speak different languages, but we all laugh in the same language. And I love having a laugh, Sean. You know, and even, even during hard fights, even during hard fights, and I was in plenty of hard fights, I still wanted to try and do an alley shuffle and I still wanted to entertain the crowd because it is the entertaining yeah, it's business. Yeah, it's the entertainment industry. It's the entertainment business. And I, I had a big following, you know, in Ireland. I was, yeah. I was a big draw in Ireland. And I was interviewed by Jimmy McGee constantly on television and radio because I was, he used to say... Uh, nice. Yeah, I always pride, nice I pride myself on Manor Sean, always have. I've done adverts on television in Ireland. I've done, I was a big fish in a small pond in Ireland. I've done a uh, Lions Tea Bag advert, I've done a Murphy Stout advert, I've done uh, adverts for um, um, American Express. And I was a people's champion, that's what yeah. Dad used to say to me. I lost my parents, God rest both of them in 2022. My dad went on the 24th of April, his 85th birthday, my mum went on the 28th of December, it was a bad year. But um, my dad used to say, you're the people's champion, Joe. I was so easy to approach, you know, because like I said, I've prided myself my manners. Then, as a boy, and now as a man, I still do. Manners make it the person, yeah. you know, but I always had a big following. Always had a big following because I was in good fights, Joe. When was a draw, I was Great always- Great fights. I was always, yeah. I was always trying my best. If my best wasn't good enough, I fought men that were, so much better than me. I knew I hadn't got a chance. I was hoping that they'd have a bad day. Yeah, but and you get an exceptional day. Twenty percent. But I gave it my all, and that's all we can all do is to try our best. Yeah. yeah and uh, I tried my best. Best. Wasn't good enough. I dreamed about becoming a champion of the world. Every fighter that climbs into the ring dreams about becoming a champion of the world. I wasn't near good enough. I fought lots of world champions, but to win several Irish titles is a, a major achievement. I think, Joe representing your country oh, is good as one. good as a world title you know you're going out there with that green vest on yeah what how did that make you when you got picked to represent ireland what was that feeling like what did you get a phone call at home what I'd was won, it like Joe? I'd, won, I'd won the under 19 title at 17 and won the under 19 title i turned 17 and um i won the junior title within a couple of months of each other. And then they picked me to box for Ireland in a senior tournament against England. Ireland's oh. greatest rivals, you know? <laughs> and uh, I was picked to fight against England. I was fighting uh, an ABA champion, a six foot five, oh, thank you, a six foot five supreme athlete, Bobby Wells. And he battered me, Sean. I'd um, never done a three well, the first two rounds. I was in, I was in fat kid, Sean. I turned 17 in November, I fought in January 6th in Milton Keynes. And uh, the great Harry Carpenter commentated the fight. Where's Harry? 
And he says, uh, this is a baptism of fire for Roly Poly Yee. He goes, I was a little chubby kid. But I was no, sure. Game. Bobby As Wells. Bobby Wells hit me with bombs. Hit me with bombs. He got the bronze medal in the Olympics shortly after. So Lennox Lewis got the bronze in the 84 Olympics. I speak to Bobby regular. I haven't met up since that fight, but we speak regular. And I tell him, he helped me become the man I am today. Because I knew there was more to the sport then than just being tough, you know? I'm going to get a bit of tissue, Sean. I don't know what I've done with my handkerchief, but I must have it in my pocket. I grab it. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I, um, I've always been tough, Sean, but I think the beatings from the bullies made me tough. I had to grow up tough. Yeah. And Bobby Wells... And your dad working away as well. Yeah, left Bobby, behind, Wells, Bobby Wells stopped me with 22 seconds to go. I just ran out of steam, Sean. Yeah. But what, a, what a fight, though, no Joe. And that, oh, was, was, that must have been... Thank you so much, thank you. That must have been, Joe, one of the... F that was a four-rounder. No, it was a three, three, three minute rounds. I'd never done, I'd never done a three minute round, Sean. I'd never done was three, two minute rounds. And, and that, that was your first three threes? First three threes, yeah. That's what Harry Carpenter said, a baptism of fire for young Egan, young roly-poly Egan. But the thing is, it helped me. And it made me realise there's more to this sport than just being tough. Because I was ah. getting by just being tough, hard, hard, half-heartedly training, thinking, well, I'm, I'm a hard case. I'd left school when I was 14 years of age, Sean. And I was on the doors of nightclubs when I was 15. And I thought I was a tough guy. I really did think I was a tough guy. Bobby yeah. Wells showed me that he was a tougher guy than me, with a lot of class and a lot more experience than me. And uh, he, gave me a, he gave me a lesson that stood me for the rest of my life, because then I realised that I've got to train. And that's, that's, what to train. And that's when I went out to um, the mindset that I've got to train, I can't just be tough guy yeah you've got to be fit it's like having it's like having a racing car with the best engine in the world but you've got no petrol in that engine you're not going nowhere you're not going, going, <laughs> you know, going far it. and uh, I'm not saying that it was uh, a great engine or a pristine racing car but I just didn't train Sean when when you first represented Ireland Joe yeah what did you mean with that feel Great. <laughs> Great. It's, listen, you, you, Come you, on, this is their son, bro. Yeah. I boxed in, um, in England, I boxed in Milton Keynes, and it was on television, which was, which was incredible. The whole rings end and Dublin was watching yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I know I lost, but I, I, I don't Listen, you represent your country. I've done my best, Sean. And um, yeah, it was a great feeling to stand in the ring, be introduced to your opponent, and then the national anthems are playing. Ah, oh, come on. And um, we are a bit the rivals with the English. Yeah. What was that? nothing personal. When that national anthem was playing, Joe, come on, man. What the, was the, Irish want, the Irish want to beat the English at Ludo, everything, dominoes, <laughs> anything. Yeah. We just have the rivalry yeah. with England. You know, but I think the world has the rivalry with England because England has ruled the world with so many sports. Yeah. You know, they've yeah. been yeah. they've been yeah. such domineer dominance in different sports, yeah. you know, and uh, they've had so many great boxing world champions, you know, they won the World Cup in the soccer, they've been the rugby champions. And I think the rivalry around the world that has against England. Yeah. But I love this country. But it's, so. it's this a country. I actually love this country. This country has been, when my boxing career finished, it's been, it's, it's been good to me, Sean. Yeah. The English people are good people. Yeah. You know, working, hard working people. Yeah, there's politicians everywhere that cause problems for people, but it's not the people's fault. No, you know? no, it never is. No. It never is. So, I enjoyed that experience of representing my country more than words can say, Sean. <laughs> Didn't enjoy the fact that I lost, but I gave a good account of myself. I've yeah. done my best. But Joe, being picked again for yeah, your country for Ireland, says a lot, Joe. I boxed for Ireland 12 times, Sean, and I won more than I lost for Ireland. Yeah. I lost, um, I lost to an American, but I beat two Americans. I lost to an Italian, but I beat an Italian. I lost to a Greek. I beat a, a Welshman. I beat a Polish. 
box ride, I think I boxed ride 12 times. And like I said, I won more than lost. I won, won a bronze medal in the Acropolis Games, which was a world record tournament, which was, which was fantastic. Yeah. Dad used to say to me, he used to call me for my runs in the morning, Sean, he used to say, drag yourself out of bed, son. It's like dragging yourself off the deck when you get put down. And I used to say to my dad, no one's ever going to put me down, dad. No one's going to put me down. Bobby Wells didn't put me down. He put me onto the second rope. He made an uppercut. Yeah. And I went onto the second rope, Sean, but I was so tired. tired just right? He didn't knock me out. I, I was stopped on my feet. I was just fatigued and tired. And I took a lot of punches and a lot of punishment. But the first time I was ever flat on my back, pardon me, it was exactly like my dad had described. It's like dragging myself out of bed in the morning. I was, after boxing in the Acropolis Games, I beat an Italian, beat a Canadian, and I'm in the semi-finals against the Greek. My left eye was badly damaged, Sean. I shouldn't have passed the medical, but the Greek had got a boy in his first fight, so he'd only had his second fight. And if they'd given him a boy in his third fight, he would have, so had, one fight. He would have had one fight into the final. I think when he beat the Dutchman in the final, Van der Leiden. So it wouldn't have been fair if he'd gone into the finals with one fight, yeah. and the man he's fighting in the final after having three. So the Greek doctor passed me on the medical. My two corner and Mickey Hawkins and Jerry Hanna said, your eyes too badly damaged, Joe, you can't fight. I said, the doctor said, I'm allowed to fight. I'm fighting. So your corner men wanted you not to fight? They didn't want me to fight. So my eye was a squint. My eye was a squint and my left eye was badly damaged. But you could see out the other eye? I could see out my right eye. That's enough. Right? That's enough for me, <laughs> right? But I could see with a squint. You know, I was badly swollen, badly bruised. They didn't want me to get into that really. But I thought, if I win, I went to the final. Anyway, the first round, I went at the Greek, Georgia stepping up, as I went in them hammer and tongs. Closed my eye completely. I come back to my corner. They said, but I'm not letting you out for round two. I said, I'm going out for round two. Winners never quit and quitters never yeah. win. I'm going out for round two. Yeah. So I've gone out for round two. I didn't even see the punch coming, Sean. I couldn't see. I've been hit with better punches. Yeah. I've been hit with bombs. I'm not saying it was a bomb. But it put me flat on my back. And it's not punches you don't see coming, what do you Knock me spark out, Sean. Yeah. Right? Knock me spark out. I don't I don't remember the punch landing. I didn't see the punch coming. I'm on my back. And I'm doing this in the ring, lying on my back. My cornerman thought I was calling them into the ring. I wasn't. I was looking for my bed sheet, Sean. I'm flat on my back. Looking for my bed sheet. Could you hear that saying, get up? <laughs> I'm asleep. This is what my dad had described to me. Could you hear him shouting, get out of the bed? <laughs> this is what he described to me years before. So I rolled over onto my side. My left eye's closed. I'm still looking for my bed sheets. Mickey Hawkins and Jerry Hanna were in the ring at that stage. I saw the referee go five. Well, they weren't in the ring at that stage, but I saw the referee go five. And I thought, I'm on the deck here. I got myself to my feet. Mickey Hawkins and Jerry Hanna were in the ring at that stage and I fell into their arms. The fight was stopped, but I stopped on my feet. On your feet, yeah. And I lost to the eventual gold medalist. But I remember phoning my dad. I said, Dad, I won a bronze medal. He said, well done, son. I said, remember you told me all the years before, Dad? Like dragging yourself out of bed when you get deck. He said, you got deck, son? I said, I did, Dad. I said, I did. I said, round two. But I got up and got bleed on my feet. I said, it was exactly like you described, Dad. Exactly like you described. Like he must have been decked at some stage yeah. in his life. I could never see that because in my eyes he was the toughest man on the planet. In every boy's eyes he's yeah, the yeah, toughest man on the planet, you know? So I said it was exactly like it was then, exactly like you said. But I got to my feet, I was beat on my feet. And it was uh, a great feeling when a bronze medal for my country. Come on. In a world ranking tournament, you know? Yeah. So that was the, probably the, um, the highlight of my career, winning a bronze medal. Winning seven Irish titles was another highlight of my career. But the best win of my career was against America. I'd already lost to America. And then I got in against Bruce Seldon, who went on to win the World Heavyweight title. Big puncher. First puncher. round, first round, Sean. Class, better than, 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 than anything I'd ever been in with. And I'd been yeah. in with Lennox Lewis at that stage. I'd had a good fight with Lennox. So you boxed Leonard? I fought Lennox in 85. I'd been sparring with Mike Tyson and uh, they couldn't get anybody to fight Lennox. I'd won the New York Golden Gloves, New York State Golden Gloves, and it was the New York All-Stars against the Canadian All-Stars. He was the star of the Canadian team, and Frankie Lars was the star of the New York team. And um, the guy that beat me in the New York City Golden Gloves, the guy that beat me in the New York City Golden Gloves, St. Clair Bab, he got knocked out in the American Championships, 
knocked back out by a, an American called Kamuro Du, who went on to win the American title. And he boxed against America. He boxed for America against Canada and got knocked out by Lennox Lewis. So the New York champion who'd been knocked out by yeah. the Lennox Lewis knocked out wouldn't fight. So they said that they'd no one to fight Lennox Lewis. I said, I'll fight him. They said, Joe, the guy that beat you got knocked out by the man that got knocked out by Lennox Lewis. I said, yeah, but he didn't knock me out. I've been sparring with Mike Tyson. I've been taking Mike Tyson's punishment. I've got a good chin. I've got strong legs. I will be able to take Lennox Lewis's punches. And I did. He battered me for three rounds, but I stayed on my feet, Sean. And I lost on points. So I know, I know when I'm fighting Selden, when I'm fighting Selden, first round, Sean, the movement of him, the class. I couldn't get near him. I couldn't get near him. I was throwing punches and he was gone. This is a 15 stone powerhouse man, graceful, like a ballet dancer, moving. I was hitting shadows. End of the round, I've come back to my corner. He'd been hitting me. I'd been in the shadow. I come back to my corner, same thing again. I want to retire you myself. I've heard that so many yeah. times. Yeah, not a chance. <laughs> I've heard that not so many chance. times in my career. We're retiring you on the stool. I said, no way, no way. I'm not retiring on my stool. I come out for round two, Sean. Selden's looking at me, walking from my corner. He couldn't understand. <laughs> I've just caned you in round one. And you're coming back I'm for walking out for round two. The bell went, Sean. I couldn't get near him in round one. The bell went, I was entitled to hit him. He stood still for that split second. Bang. I've hit him a body shot, Sean. I sunk it into him. The best punch that I felt I could throw at that moment in time. I've landed him. Bang. And I could see him sink. He wilted, Sean. Now it's on. I've slowed it down now. Now it's I'm gonna on. get near him. Yeah. I'm gonna get near him. <laughs> now anyway, it's on. Anyway, I did. I got near him and I went on to win. To me, probably the best win of my career because that man went on to win the, the world, world heavyweight title. title. Yeah. You know, after the fight, there was 10 great world champions in attendance, Sean. Something very spectacular. Jake Lamont of the Raging Bull, Rocky Graziano, Joe Fraser, Jersey Joe Walker, Sandy Sands, and Billy, Billy Conn. 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 the film of Floyd Patterson, Chico Vija. And, uh, I want to get to the Floyd Patterson. There was, was ten, 10 world champions in attendance, and we were boxing in their honour. So after the fight, I have to go to the hospital, Sean. I'm in a bad way, even though I won. I'm in a bad way. I'm in the back of the ambulance. The adrenaline's wearing off. I'm in a lot of pain. I'm thinking, I haven't heard Selden that bad, so they're not delaying for Selden. Jake Lamont of the Raging Bull, he'd been fighting the fight on the outside of the ropes. It was like a throwback to one of his fights. Yeah. And he tripped and cut his eye and hurt his arm. And he was brought to the back of the ambulance, Sean. I'm in pain. In the same ambulance? Same ambulance, Sean. Same ambulance. Lamar. Jake Lamar to the Raging Bull. Listen to this, Sean. Incredible. So as he's brought into the back of the ambulance, he looks at me. And he goes, the heavyweight. Great fight, kid. Wow. Best anesthetic <laughs> I've ever had. <laughs> Raging Bull complimented me on a fight. Anyway, we became friends. And I visited, what a him. Man. I visited him in New York many times. And when he came to the UK to visit me, he did me the greatest of honours, Sean. He did two book signings with me. One in Doncaster and one in Carlisle. Steve wow. Collins came to yeah. the one in Carlisle yeah. and he came to the one in Doncaster. Well. And he came to Canary Wharf when the book was launched. But we were interviewed by the, the TV in Doncaster. Andy Booker had arranged the uh, book signing in the TV. Andy, Andy's one of uh, Mike Tyson's closest friends and uh, biggest fan around the world. He was Mike's number one fan all yeah. over the world, he travelled to watch Mike fight. And he used to say to people, I'm going to have Mike Tyson in my village in Ascot and Doncaster. Like I used to say, I'm going to have Mike Tyson in my town, Rings End. And people used to laugh at us both. But when Mike visited when Ascot, with, with, yeah. when Andy, and when he visited Rings End with me, the laugh. Was, so you'll stop laughing you know, now, you have to be I had a boxer dog called Tyson. When I came back from America, people used to say to me, that's a stupid name for a dog show. I said, listen, please believe You're going to wear the name of There'll be, be a lot of dogs called Tyson in the future. <laughs> when Jake did the book signing in Doncaster, we were interviewed by the TV, and they said to Jake Lamotta, they said, we were Joe friends a long time. He said, me and Joe go way back. He said, Joe was like me. Joe would fight anybody. And I thought, what a compliment. Yeah, the raging bull. But he said, he wasn't so fat then. <laughs> uh, I, I piled on a bit of weight at that stage, you know, but my weight fluctuates, you know, I'm up and down. Yeah. It depends on, 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 on what I'm training and why I'm training and how I'm eating. But, uh, yeah, what an incredible experience sharing an ambulance with Jake Lamotta. You know, one of the greatest fighters of all time. Wow.
Mate, yeah. he's got a win over Ray Robinson. I went to the restaurant. Come on. I went to the restaurant when I'm in Gallagher's Steakhouse in New York. We had dinner in Gallagher's Steakhouse. And they actually had one of the press conferences. The staff in the restaurant, the management, Mr. Lamont and Mr. Lamont, big stands and hello. And me and him were eating dinner. It was me, him, his, 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 his partner, my, 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 my Mrs. Ruth, and uh, Tom Casino, the photographer. And I'm going to tell you a story now. I'm going to tell you a story now, Sean. An incredible story. Right? I'm bringing, bringing back some memory. This is. <laughs> we, um, this was 2004, Sean. And I'd lived in New York in 1984. I used to watch the rich people go into the Waldorf Hotel. And I used to say, one day I'm going to stay there. I'm going to stay at the Waldorf. 20 years, living a dream. When they gave me an advance for my book, they gave me an advance for the money for my book. The book was launched in 2005. Mike Tyson launched the book. I never, I've never told this story before, Sean. Come on in. I've never told this story before. But they gave me an advance. So when they gave me the advance in 2004, I said to, to my fiance Ruth, and my friend that I was working for, Gary Peak. I said, we're going to go to New York. We're going to go to the Waldorf Hotel. So we flew, business class with Erlingus, and with two presidential suites in the Waldorf Hotel. Sean. Incredible. Limousine picked us up. Anyway, when, when um, I got the chance, we went to see Jake LaMotta. He was living on 87th. Um, street in Manhattan, which is a very affluent part of Manhattan, probably the most expensive street per square foot in Manhattan. It's a beautiful, I mean, a fabulous place out in Florida as well. So we've gone for dinner. Gary had actually gone up to, to Miami to visit his mother in, in Miami. So he didn't come for dinner with us. So we're in the Gallagher Steakhouse. And um, the management, Mr. Armada. Privilege and a pleasure to have you. The pictures on the wall of that the press conference there, one of the fights with Sugar Ray Robinson. In the restaurant? In the restaurant. So we're sitting having food. And <laughs> so he's invited us up to his apartment. And we're in the apartment in Manhattan, in Jake Lamotta's home. Me and Ruth, Jake, his missus, and Tom Casino. And Jake said to Tom, Would you like a cigar, Tom? Tom said, yeah, I've got a cigar. He said, I've got a Cuban cigar. A Cuban cigar? Because the Cubans at the yeah. time with the thing in the bands, you know, no Cuban products in America. Yeah. He said, uh, how have you got Cuban cigars, Jake? <laughs> I think he was 74 at the time. And he said, Tom, I'm 74 years of age. He said, I've got my contacts. <laughs> and the two of them. Puffing away on the cigars. Smoking cigars. Ruth and Denise, Jake's missus, having liqueurs. And I'm looking on the pictures on the wall. Jake Lamotta, Rocky Marciano. Jake Lamotta, Sonny Liston. All these incredible champions, yeah. all on the wall. Is there one up there now, Joe Egan? No, he's, he's <laughs> Jake's sadly not with us anymore. He's gone, he's gone to the, gone to heaven. You know, because we never shot over there, he'd waltz into heaven. He was oh, an incredible yeah, yeah. human being. He's probably got a key. Well, he, he stood up against the Mafia. Yeah. Right? He stood up against the Mafia, like Cus did as well. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of corruption in boxing, Mafia controls. And um, he stood up for He was a principled man. Yeah. Man of morals. And uh, that experience, I've never told that story. <laughs> but Joe, the boxing, let's... You are so well known worldwide for your boxing and the experiences you've had in boxing but not a lot of people talk about what you do for charities what you put back into kids gyms over here in Britain and all over the world let's talk about a bit of what you put back well, I'm very privileged to be in the position that I'm in because of Mike Tyson Sean people know me because of my connection with Mike he was one of the greatest heavyweight champions of all time the youngest ever heavyweight champion and I sparred with the man for nearly two years and it's over 40 years ago now, Sean. So I've been well known because of Mike. Yeah. So when, when I get asked because of 
on authority because of being known, could I help? Of course I'll help. You know, people have helped me, Sean. Yeah. People still help me today. Yeah. You know, I've been very, very fortunate in life that they say if you can count your friends on one hand, you're a lucky person. I'd need to be an octopus, Sean. <laughs> I've got that many friends, I people need, that have helped me. I need so a few more sets of arms. <laughs> yeah. So when people, when people ask me, would I get involved and help? Of course I would. Yeah. You know, no problem whatsoever. I'm involved with a lot of charities. And you've proved to me, John, over the years that you do just jump in and help. Of course, Sean. Yeah. You know, because, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled to be asked. Yeah. And I'm very fortunate and privileged to be in the position that I can make a difference. Yeah. And if everybody, if everybody was to do their bit, give a little back. The world would be a better place, Sean, yeah. you know. I'm not on a crusade. I just want to help. Yeah. You know, there's better people out there than me that are doing a lot more than me. And you watch these programs on the television where they get no, you know, notice and recognition for what they do. And rightly me so, yeah. you know, because people do need help. We live in a we live in a cruel, harsh world, Sean. Muhammad Ali, the great Muhammad Ali, used to say, "I love this saying." He said, "I wish people loved each other as much as they loved him." You know, and yeah. he, it's a great he, saying. It's great saying. He did so much for so many. You know, for every race yeah. on the world. Yeah, and I'd like to think that I'm. I'm emulating him. I tried to emulate him in the boxing ring. Yeah. I should do the alley shuffle as a tribute we, to We him. all did, didn't we? But I, I tried to emulate him, you know, with doing my little piece. I couldn't do what he could do because he had the platform, the platform to do it, yeah. you know. He was the heavyweight champion of the world, Olympic gold medalist. But I tried to do my little bit. And if we all done a little bit, all them little bits add up to, to a big, massive bit. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it has the ripple effect. And, I do, uh, the one at the moment, Sean, is the, the stabbing, the anti-knife crime. Anti-knife crime, yeah. I've tried to encourage people, don't stab, jab, get down to the boxing ring. The boxing gym is a safe haven. Whether you're going to box and compete as a fighter, you're safe in the boxing gym. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The camaraderie in the boxing gym, it's a safe haven, yeah. you know, and it's sad when you see young children, young adults, male and female, the lives been took now by knife crime. Yeah, it's, but it's not just them, Joe, it's the domino effect of the families, of both sets of families, you know, the victims. It's tragic, it's, it's tragic. It, it's, it's very, very tragic and it's very sad. So that is my um, focus at the moment. I've done all sorts of charities for the cancer, for the leukemia, for all sorts of illnesses um, I've done. Without illness. even a blink of hesitation. My time's free, Sean. I'll be there, yeah. you know, and uh, the one, like I said, at the moment is the anti-knife crime and the anti-bullying. You know, I've lectured in um, all sorts of environments because people think it just happens to kids, it happens to adults as well. Mm -hmm. Films, John. How did you get into acting? Just on a stroke of luck, Sean. I did a, a, a dinner event. I did a dinner event with uh, the great Joe Frazier. Ken Purchase and Charlie Hare. Charlie Hare was the compere. Ken Purchase was the promoter. Ken gave me an opportunity to share the top table with Joe Frazier. I'd sparked Mike Tyson for the Marvis Frazier fight. So I'm sitting beside Marvis and Joe several great champions of the world and attendance on the top table. I was so, I was so happy, Sean, to be with this illustrious company yeah. on this top table, getting applauded by a thousand people at the Hilton Hotel in London. <laughs> I was like, I was just, yeah. busy, Sean. <laughs> and then Cass Pennant was in attendance and I knew who Cass was yeah. because he's the West Ham fan. That's right. That's legendary. Nice yeah, yeah, and uh, he was the book publisher. My nephew Tom was a West Ham fan. So I knew who Cass was. So when I was introduced to Cass, half joking, half old and earnest, I said, you might write a book about me. And he said, well, let me hear what you've got to say tonight. 
So I said to Charlie on the computer, I said, how long have we got to speak? He said, five minutes. <laughs> Not going to get much in in five minutes. But I got as much as I possibly could did. Did it, was it in five minutes or did it go over? Probably about ten. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I spoke to Cass after. There's a very fascinating character. He said, come to my office tomorrow. He said, and I could let Mike Tyson involved. He said, there might be a book in it. So I rang Mike the next day. He was in Brazil. I speak to Mike Gregor on the phone. He was in Brazil. Put him onto the phone to Cass. And uh, Cass said about the book. And Mike said, anything for my brother Joe. Yeah. He did the forward for the book. He came to the UK to I launch the book. Yeah, I remember this. He came to the UK to launch the book in Canary Wharf. Probably one of the proudest days of my life. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people in attendance. People queued overnight. Yeah. Several world champions in attendance. Barry McGuigan, Steve Collins, two great Irish world champions. Alan Minter, Paul Silke Jones. All to get Charlie your book. All there. Brian London, all these great champions. And thousands of people. I know everybody was there for Mike Tyson, but Mike Tyson was there for me. Your book. He was there to launch the book, and it broke all book sales records for a launch on that day. And the book went on to be a bestseller. It was re-released um, a year later with two new chapters. One of the chapters being the original book launch and uh, Mike's visit to the UK. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this or not, though, but they've took the book off the shelves now for a reason. No. I thought they took it off because no, they're no. making the film. No, no, the book has been re-released with a different company show. Ah. Right? It, it, what, what happened was, what happened was, you're not far wrong. You're not far wrong. You're too tough to tell you you're totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> I know my limitations, you're still fit. I don't know. But, uh, made your own voice, so sure. <laughs> No, what happened was, um, Pendant Publications went yeah. into the films. Cass gave up um, publishing books and he sold the rights to the books to uh, Bonnier Books. Covid hit, so Bonnier Books didn't print the book for two years. And the contract says that if they don't print the book for two years, it goes back to the original people. Right. Now the man that wrote the book, Ronald Graham, has since tragically died. So the book rights came back to me and Cass. So Cass was involved with the film, so he said, Joe, the rights are yours. So I spoke to a friend of mine, Sean Atwood, who you know. Yeah, I know Sean. And Sean said, um, I can publish the book, Joe. He said, uh, through Amazon. So he re-released the book through Amazon. And uh, that's how it got re-released. But Bonnier didn't actually um, print any books or publish any books because mm -hmm. of the COVID. Yeah. But that meant after the two years, the contracts were none of them. Right. And uh, it wasn't that they didn't want to do any, but since this has happened, since this has come about, the book became a, a bestseller twice. And um, I've now signed the rights for it to be a film. So, fingers crossed, you want to get somebody good looking to play me in the film. Well, I was just, I was going to get there, Joe. Were you not going to play yourself? No, Jesus, no, I'm not a good enough actor. I'm not a good enough actor. But the guy that's, Cass Pennant is, is, is penning the book with uh, Eddie Webber. And um, there's, uh, a lot of buzz at the moment, Sean. About there must be a little cameo in there for you. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Cast on a cameo, and Cast did a cameo in his film, Cass. And um, I got to play the landlord of the Britannia pub with, with, with my wife Ruth. And um, that's how the film career took off. Because when I was on the film with the actor Tama Hassan, who's an ex-boxer, yeah. he said, you've got a great presence on screen, Joe. He said, uh, would you fancy an acting career? My agent could do something with you. I thought I've acted my way through a boxing career, I'll give it a go. <laughs> you know, so uh, I, uh, I uh, met his agent. Fuck off acting, no, man. Yeah. Fucking fuck. I, I met his agent, Camille, and she sent me to an audition for Sherlock Holmes, the first Sherlock Holmes film, to play a character called McMurdo, to fight Robert Downey Jr. And uh, when in on the casting, they said, look into the camera lens, give an intimidating stare. So I've done that show and the casting agents went, wow, you've got an amazing intimidating stare. I said, I'm going to look into the eyes of Mike Tyson and Lennox Lewis trying to intimidate <laughs> you tell them. I was trying to smile. <laughs> this is my happy face. <laughs> so uh, I got the part, went along to the read through. Me and my pal Richard Grimes, he drove me down to London, got the Carriages Hotel. Richard shouldn't have even been in the room. He sat in the corner, big oval table, all the hierarchy of Warner Brothers. My name played Joe Egan next to Jude Law, Robert Downey Jr., 
Eddie Marshall, Rachel Academy, the one the Academy Award for South Paul. All the hierarchy, all the stars, sitting opposite Guy Ritchie and Joel Silver, the CEO of Warner Brothers. My pal Richard in the corner, shouldn't have been here. <laughs> I can talk to Next the more, Richard's a male man. Next the more, <laughs> next the more, you're a character. Richard goes, you're a character. Oh, I'm a male, Richard. Wait, did I tell you the truth, Dale? Not about money, man. I'm not. Listen, I know he's a male man. I don't know what part of male. I've been the male with him as well. And yeah, I've been over with him and his family. That's some great crack with Richard over the years. That's that's my part. Anyway, um, my grandmother came from Casabar. Did yeah, she? Yeah, yeah, my grandmother came from Castle Bar. My mum's, my dad's mum. The best white pudding in the world comes from Castle Bar. Well, you know something, it's, it's, it's a good county mayo. But I've got family in lots of counties. My, my, my dad's daddy came from Dundalk, he was county now, man. And uh, my grandmother, my, da my, my dad's dad mum. My dad was Drogada. I know Drogada well. Good mm. champions out of Drogada. Yeah. I used to drive to Drogada going to Belfast when, uh, when I was boxing pro. But uh, my mum's. My mum's mum came from Cork and my mum's dad came from Dublin. So there's four counties and my grandparents and then my great grandparents, more counties, so family all over Ireland. Anyway, so I'm sitting opposite Joel Silver, the CEO of Warner Brothers and Guy Ritchie, and Guy said, Joe, I've been trying to get you in one of my films for a long time. I said, You're joking. I'm Robert Downey Jr. Guy Richard's Iron Man. And he goes, Joe, you come with a fearsome reputation. I couldn't believe these people even knew this me. This is so. Downey Jr. saying to you. You come with a fearsome reputation, Joe. He's not been like this down at me. I couldn't believe that this man even knew me. So I thought, no way. We travelled in the minibus to do the practice fight, and Guy said, how are things, Joe? I said, things are okay, Guy, I'm making it. Me. He said, has your agent told you much again for the fight scene? I said, I never even asked. I'm just so honoured to be in your film. <sighs> when he told me, Sean, when he told me more than I got in any of my pro fights, a big amount of money. And I was deadly serious. I said, Guy, I said, for that money, Robert Downey Jr. can really hit me. You can kick me as well as you want to. He took a fit and laughed and he said, Joe, I don't want you to be beaten up. I said, for that amount of money, I said, I'll get the show kill me in the hospital. <laughs> no problem. He said, Joe, you're not getting beaten up in this film. You're not getting beaten up in this film. He put me into the prison scene that wasn't in the script. I get called my own name, I get called Big Joe by an Academy Award winner in a Warner Brothers movie directed by Guy Ritchie. It's made, my mum's gone now, God doesn't, but it made her so proud, she, ah. because she never wanted to be the box. No mother wants to see her son being beaten up, you know, and I took some bad beatings in the ring. But she saw me getting killed and beaten up on screen so many times, but she knew it wasn't for real. Yeah. You know, so I've done my dad proud of hope in my boxing career, and I've done my mum proud of hope in my acting career, you know, because that's all. I've ever wanted to do. I think that's all. Your parents. Any, any yeah. child wants to do is do their parents proud. But it was a, a door opening for me because after the Sherlock Holmes film, the films just came in and came in and came in. I get to play the tough guy. I get to play the gangster, Sean, because I've had to live the life of a tough guy, and I've been around the underworld with the boxing. Yeah. You know, so I know how to portray a tough guy because I've had to live the life. Well, of a tough guy, working security. Perfect to wear on my gun now, John. Thank you. Your DNA makeup is a fighting man. So that ain't going to leave until the day you go in that box. I don't think any of us, Joe, sure, can get you. that out of us. Let me tell you something now. I've had a few fights with the Grim Reaper, Sean. Yeah. He's come for me on a few I occasions. Know. You know, I've been on a life support machine for five days, mm. three days in a coma, but I fought the Grim Reaper off then. That was an incident in America. Mm. I had an incident in Birmingham where I was nearly killed. Mm. I fought the Grim Reaper off then, you know. I fought the Grim Reaper off a few times. I'm not ready to go yet, Sean. Mm. The DNA job is a fighting man through and through. I'm alive. But and it ain't a proud man. A very proud, dignified. So. With that fire in your belly, Joe, yeah. it don't go out. No. And it's obviously very, very raging at the minute. It's a furnace, Sean. I know where you're it's going. It's a furnace at the minute. <laughs> I know where you're no. going, Joe. Go on. You see, your fire is still raging, yeah. Joe. But it was calm until a few months ago when somebody threw a gauntlet down to every 58-year-old on the planet. Tell us about this, John. What had happened, Sean? 
I did a movie called Prize Fighter. I've only recently said this. Because I want yeah, I wanted to sit with John Fury and look him in the eye. I wanted to look him in the eye and ask him this, right? But I had to tell the interviewer before I got to sit with John Fury and say it to him. I did a movie called Prize Fighter with Russell Crowe, Ray Winston and Matt Pierce, whose father Dave Pierce was the ex British heavyweight champion. Yeah. John went to the premiere in Cannes, I couldn't attend the premiere. And Russell Crowe, Ray Winston, Matt Pierce. You were on a cruise? No, I wasn't. I was. I was um, on holiday? No, I, I don't know where. I can't remember where I was, Sean. Some, sometimes I regret having that last fight. I won't punch too many. I forget things. I forget where I was, but I couldn't make the premiere. I remember you saying you I was, couldn't I was, make the premiere. I, I couldn't make the premiere, and uh, somebody, Russell Crowe, Ray Winston, Matt Pierce, brought up the conversation about boxing. And, uh, this is at the premiere? At the premiere. At the after party or whatever? Before the film, before the film. And um, somebody mentioned to John Fury and this illustrious company, there's another boxer in the film, John. Joe Egan. Do you know Joe? Right, so who said that to, to John? He knows who said it. Yeah. I was told this, right? And it was said to him. And John Fury looked this person in the eye. And he goes, I know Joe Egan. Joe Egan is a fraud. Joe Egan is a fake hard man. This man's meant to so be So he doesn't friend. know you, John? Who? John doesn't. John Fury knows me. Not really. He knows me well. John knows me, but the thing is, John likes to steal the thunder from his sons. His yeah. son's the heavyweight champion of the world, a great heavyweight champion of the world. His other boy, Tommy, is doing ever so well in the boxing, yeah. making a great living. Fair play to them. And John is trying to steal their thunder. I know he's their father. I know there is flesh and blood, there is pride and joy. But even the way he describes them as his children is disgusting, Sean. Yeah. You know, I won't even say how he describes them as his children. But he likes to steal their thunder. So if he likes to steal their thunder, he's hardly going to give me any credit, right? So he said this. So I got told this. And I was very upset. Very, very upset, right? I saw the video of him yesterday, posing with his biceps and all, saying, I'm like the Hulk. Well, I'm a bit like the Hulk as well, John. Do you understand? I'm a bit like the Hulk as well. They wouldn't like me when I'm angry. That was the Hulk saying. Yeah. And I'm angry with John Fury. Very, very angry. So suddenly then he's doing this, I'll fight any 58 year old on the planet. I'm the hardest 58 year old on the planet. Well, I'm not the hardest 58 year old on the planet. You're far, never far from it. to be, John. Never have. I've never, never claimed to be a tough guy. Never have, never will. People say I could take a beating of the best fighting men on the planet. And I've took beatings of the best fighting men on the planet. I don't claim to be the hardest 58 year old on the planet but I know I'm harder than John Fury. So I stood up to his challenge. I said, I'll fight you, John, because I've got a grievance with you now. Yeah. Do you understand? But well, I wanted to sit in a press conference. He's kind of made it personal. But it's personal now. Um, Very personal. But I wanted to sit in a press conference. And I wanted to see the man's reaction. I wanted to look him in the eye and say, he said I was a fraud. He said I was a fake hard man. The only fake thing about me, Sean, is my turn. That's the only fake thing about me. I am who I am. Yeah. I've always been who I am. I can't be anybody else. I've got the same friends I've had since I've been a little boy and I've gathered as I've gone along the road. I don't do anybody any wrong. I try my best to conduct myself. Boxing doesn't just need great fighters, it needs great ambassadors. ambassadors. I've tried to be a dignified, great ambassador for boxing. Ambassador. I've tried to be a great ambassador for my country. I've tried to be a great ambassador for my family. And I've carried myself to the best of my ability. Yeah. I've got, like I said, I want to be known as a nice guy, not as a hard case. I've yeah, never he, wanted to be known as a hard case. I've never portrayed myself as a hard case. John Fury does. Yeah. He portrays himself as a hard case. Well, now I've stepped up to the mark. Come on then, John. But he's gone, why has he gone so quiet, John? Because he knows he's been exposed as a bully. Yeah. He knows I can burst his bubble. Do you understand? Yeah. He got hit by one heavyweight champion of the world and was knocked out. Henry Ackerman one day. Yeah, I've been hit by four heavyweight champs of the world. I never knocked out. That chin is granite, Sean. Yeah. That chin is granite. Yeah. Right? I know I can take his punches. We're two old men. We're 58 years of age. We're in the last stages of our life. This is the third stage, you know. We've had the youth, yeah. middle stages, and now we're in the end stages. And I hope I get a few more years out of me yet. Tomorrow isn't promised to anybody. No. 
this day is a gift from God. That's why this, this, day, is, this day is called the present. Yeah. It's a gift from it's God. Present, yeah. I pray every day. I believe in the power of prayer. Call him Allah, call him Buddha, call him whatever you want, as long as you respect him in the right way. Respect yourself and respect others. And respect others' beliefs. Yeah. And my belief is that on my day, I can beat John Fury. Right? He probably believes on his day he could beat me. I get into the ring and show it. Because he's gone very, very quiet now. The fact that I've stood up and said, I'll fight you, John. Mm. And I want to fight him. Misfits boxing, they're putting the money on the table. And like I said, we're two old men for boxing. But, you know, we're not racehorses, Sean. We're two donkeys. Two donkeys make a great race. But, Joe, you know, you know looking if at it. There's a racehorse in against a donkey, it wouldn't be a race. We're two donkeys. We're not going to be dancing around the ring. Them days are long gone. But that. We'll stand in the centre of the ring, Sean, and we'll punch each other. <laughs> I'm just going to go there. We'll punch each other on the chin. Yeah. And well, my chin is better than his. Because the footwork now will be a little bit less than what it was. It could make for a great tear up. It will be a great tear up if it happens. You know, because of the lack of footwork, Joe, from both of you. We're all warriors. Don't, don't mean it disrespectfully. No. I you know yourself, sure. your feet will have slowed. Yeah. But your power won't. The power don't leave, Joe. This is what a lot of, you know, I've, I've watched recently a couple of the pods you've done, but they don't talk about the process of a fighter's life as he grows older. Your power don't go nowhere. Sean, I've got a training camp arranged, right? Me and John would have never had the luxury of a training camp. John would have worked on a building site and then got the fight pro. I worked the door in the pub, I worked the door in a nightclub, and I worked in Dublin Airport for Delta Airlines. Tried to sleep for a couple of hours, tried to train for a few hours, go to work, tried to sleep for a couple of hours, eat, sleep, train. I never had the luxury of a training camp. So we never fulfilled any potential that we had as pros. Because you can't, not living like that, training like that, sleeping like that. So if they gave us a date, say for me and John, if, he, if, he, if he's man enough to step up to the mark and stand on what he said he wants to do, and they gave us a date, say in September, we'd have a 14 week training camp. I've got my camp arranged for future venture, Adam Bailey. I said he'd, he's trained several world champions. And anything that's left in my tank after a 14 week training camp, it will come out, yeah. whatever's left. Yeah. Probably not a lot left, Sean, but it's enough left to beat John Fury. Scott Welch has said he'd come over and do some sparring with me. Amanda right, Ford for the Scott. world. Scott Ford, 12 rounds for the world heavyweight yeah, title. Brilliant. With the man that knocked out Hen uh, uh, Henrik. Man, man the man who knocked out John Fury, Henrik Amonde. Yeah. Clifton Mitchell, who fought Selko McCrory. Good fighter. Selko beat Clifton. Clift went on, Cl Selko went on to fight Lennox Lewis for the world title. Yeah. So Clifton came close to fighting for the world title. Scott fought for the world title. Um, a couple of others have said they'd come and do. Julius Francis has said he'd help me. Um, oh, what's 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 the, the other former British heavyweight champion that said he, he uh, would come and help me? Um, Some great sparring you've got there set up, Joe. Sean, Some these men will punish me. Great these sparring. men, these men are better than me. Yeah. More experienced than me, and they will hurt me in sparring. I know there's a lot of pain coming in sparring for me. But my life has been full of pain, Sean, so it's just another another chapter. Another day at the office. Another day at the office, Sean. I haven't been in a boxing ring. My last fight was when I was 38. I haven't been in a boxing ring for 20 years, Sean. But I haven't cycled the bike on the streets for 20 years. I could go out on a bike tomorrow and cycle the streets. Yeah. I'm not going to win Tour de France, but I know how to cycle a bike, the same as I know my way around the boxing ring. Yeah. I know how to cover up, I know how to hold on, and I know how to deliver a left hook and a right hand. And I think my left hook and right hand will be enough for John Fury. Yeah. Good night, John. Yeah. Right. I know I can put him to sleep. Right. Yeah. I know I can put John Fury to sleep. And I want to put John Fury to sleep. Just he's getting set on. He's just got to accept. He's just got to accept that he's thrown at the challenge. He's thrown down the gauntlet. I've been man enough. He said, "Any man brave enough, fifty-eight-year-old on this planet, to fight him?" It's Joe Egan. I'm ready to step up to the mark, Sean. You have. You've stepped up, and it's gone mm -hmm. quiet. So, your team now, Joe, you've got a great team around you now. I work for good men. Yeah. I work for, for two personal, very personal friends of mine. John O'Connor, who has well shivels, and Ali, who has lowest bullion, the jewellery jewelry shop and the jewellery quarter. Um, I do security for them. And uh, they're very kind to me at this stage of my life, Sean, to have people so kind to me. Yeah. It's wonderful. But, Joe, that's a reflection of you. 
the people are treating you the way they treat you today because of the way you've treated them all your life. Well, Don't you think? I'm also very fortunate with my wife. My wife Ruth has had to put up with um, a lot of shit with me, Sean. Yeah. A lot of shit with me. You know, I've had um, battles while I've been with Ruth, with forces, um, bully boys. Thugs. I'd imagine, Joe, that there'd be a lot of times where you'd walk out your front door and Ruth wouldn't know if you were ever coming on. Well, there was, there was a few incidents in our relationship, you know, where I've let her down. You know, I got sent to prison. That, 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 that was very hard on her. Mm. Uh, I've done things, uh, never hit a show, I've never raised my hand to a woman. Is, yeah, no chance. You're a man, John. No, I'd say you're chance. My mum used to say, she said, even in my dad's drunken rages, she said he would never raise his hand to me. And I would have hated to hear that my dad would hit my mum. Yeah. Because I worshipped the ground my dad and mother stood on. You don't hit women. There's plenty of men out there we can have a row with. You don't hit women. And that's one thing that, that I'm very proud to say I've never done. Yeah. And my daddy never done it to my mum. Yeah. You know, he might break a chair, he might, he might break something. Punch a wall. <laughs> yeah. Which is break his hand. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, so Ruth and George. Ruth endured so much and it stood by me through so much. And um, she's never got a recognition really because I've been a I've been a let down to her many times, Sean, you know. Mm, you but we're not listen, we're, we're only human beings. Yeah. We're not conditioned. We all make mistakes, Sean. We're not conditioned Everybody. not to make mistakes, you know. We all we all make mistakes. I've made enough of them to know. But um, at this stage in my life, at this stage in my life, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't take drugs, I don't gamble. I'm in a, I'm in a good job. I'm in a nice mindset, Sean. This challenge with John Fury is something that's come along, and it's a nice opportunity to go to the gym and train. Well, it will give you a bit of focus, focus, focus Sean, Sean, a little goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, lovely T-shirt, a bit of comms, colour of my skin. I don't do racism, Sean. I don't, I don't agree with racism. You know, the Irish, we fight each other. I've had some great punch-ups with my two brothers, but we don't fight a man because, because of the, the colour of his skin. skin. You know, we have been known to fight each other around the world, but we don't fight, as I said, a man because of the colour of his skin. And that's one thing I'm so proud of the Irish, that we don't do the racism. Yeah. Racism, I can't pronounce it. We were sure. victims, but, the thing is, but Joe, we've been when I, when victims I, of racism. I got shot, Sean, on the 26th of July, 1998. I got shot by part of the Combat 18, the National Front. Mm. People make the mistake that they just don't like black people or Asian people. No, no, they no, hate no. the Irish, no, no, no. you know. And I belt the royalty out of respect, Sean. I belt the no man out of fear. Yeah, I probably. can't do it. Even my sweatshirts, my T-shirts, there's two spellings of the word fear, Sean. Yeah. The person that hasn't got courage spells it, forget everything and run. The person of courage spells it, face everything and rise. And that's your clothing range, Joe. That's my clothing range, Sean, yeah, because good. that's the way I spell the word fear, face everything and rise. I'm a person of courage. And I'm a proud man, Sean. Yeah. Very proud man. Proper. Proper. Right, we're going to come to the end, Joe, but we're going to have a few favourites. Favourite food? Ooh. <laughs> I love a stew, Sean. I love a stew. We grew up on a stew. Mm -hmm. I love stew. We used to have stew. My mum used to do stew three, four days a week. We'd have stew. And um, my wife Ruth does a nice stew. So I like, that's probably one of my favourites. Let me stop um, you there, Joe. Let me just stop you there. Your stew pot. Yeah. Oh, sure. <laughs> we, 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 oh, sure, 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 sure. This has sure. just come to me from 30 years ago, oh, John. Sure. <laughs> sure. Oh. Right. Tell me about this stew right, pot. Listen to this, right? <laughs> when, when we were kids, right? When we were kids, you know, we've been friends a long time, so you know this, right? When we were kids, my uncle Sean, and uh, Sean as well, my mum's brother, used to work in the Hammond Lane in Ring's End. It was the scrapyard. Yeah. So, Pyrex was the big thing at the time. The Pyrex dishes. That's right. But they were so expensive. Yeah. So we couldn't afford to have a Pyrex dish. I love this. But 
my uncle used to smash and dismantle in the scrapyard the washing machines, yeah. right, or the tumble dryers. So I've gone down this particular day with my uncle Sean and we've dismantled the door of the washing machine. Now the glass in the door of the washing machine is a Pyrex. Yeah. So we've chucked that out, he steam cleaned it, and that was my bowl. <laughs> <laughs> that was the so so that was my bowl for a lot of years. It was a Pyrex dish. Yeah, come on. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't have had the money to buy a Pyrex in the, in the, in the, in the, in the kitchen shop. So that was my bowl. Some days I'd have cornflakes in it. <laughs> Pint of milk. <laughs> but when I had the stew in it, Sean. Oh. <laughs> that was my bowl for a lot of years. That was a joke. That was a joke, people. Oh, sure. That was funny. But I had that, that bowl for years. I had that bowl for years. I travelled with me, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> I made some journeys. Yeah. Because it was so thick, it was yeah. thick. It was like, you're not you know, breaking that. No, you're not breaking. Don't forget the heat that that would have withstood. Yeah, you know, from a from a washing machine. Yeah. So what well, wasn't going to break? <laughs> Favorite film? Oh, probably Spartacus. Come would be on. up there. Yeah. I uh, love Spartacus. Uh, Braveheart. Um, Vikings. Saving Private Ryan. Zulu. But. Yeah, um, I have a lot of favourites, but Spartacus... Every just... single one of them films is a fighting man's film. No, you see where I'm coming from, Joe? Spartacus. The DNA makeup. Spartacus was, was uh, Kirk Douglas. Bad film. Great film. Brilliant film. Every Kirk Christmas. Douglas was Spartacus and... Um, Tony Curtis. Was Antoninus. Yeah. And um, there's another one they've done together called Vikings where they were brothers, but they didn't know they were brothers. Ernest Borgnine was Seen Ragnar. It. Great film. Ernest Borgnine was Ragnar. And Spartacus was his, not Spartacus. Um, Michael Douglas. Kirk Douglas Kirk was his Douglas. son. And um, he went to, he was out this day doing whatever he was doing. And he saw the young slave, Tony Curtis, and he had the hawk. And uh, Kirk Douglas had the hawk and Tony Curtis's hawk was better. But then when mm -hmm. he went to get the hawk, Tony Curtis put the hawk on him and he took his eye out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they didn't know they were brothers, because Ragnar, That's Ragnar had, had, had fathered him on a raid to England and they were brothers. And, yeah. Uh, an incredible film. Tony Curtis had done um, two films with uh, Kirk Douglas, Spartacus and Vikings, two of my favourite movies. And the Vikings, they want to die with a sword in their hand. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, warriors. Yeah. We were invaded by the Vikings, the Irish, yeah. the Irish, we've been invaded by everybody. You know, they came in and I don't think <laughs> they, they liked the prices. Off, they didn't <laughs> like the prices. They didn't like the prices. But um, yeah, the Vikings an incredible warrior race. You know, they 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 they, they circumnavigated the world. Well yeah. You know, when you when they went to Canada from Brutal, um, brutal force. I watched the Viking series. That was filmed in Dublin. Yeah. My friend Dave Cowley works on the sets of Vikings. Dave Cowley, another great fighter. His son Keen Cowley's in the in the uh, UFC and that, you know. He's Conor McGregor's sparring partner. But Keen's a great fighter as well, like his dad. But uh, yeah, so I loved um, Spartacus to be my favourite, yeah. Right. Favourite holiday destination? Oh, I love Torquay in the UK. Believe it or believe it or not, I love Torquay. It's Cornwall? The English Riviera. All down the coast of Torquay. Babacombe is probably one of my favourite resorts. That's where they made... Is that Cornwall, Towers. Torquay? It's just off the coast of the UK. I've always liked Torquay. The English Riviera, they call it. Yeah. You know. When That's I was down on the south coast, is it? I don't know my geography, Sean. When I was in prison, when I was in prison and I got released for five days, I got released for five, five days. They call it your fled date, your facility yeah, license right. eligibility date. I went with Ruth down to Torquay. We had four nights in Torquay. And I went to a Mexican restaurant, an Italian restaurant, an Indian restaurant, and a Chinese restaurant, four different nights. So I went around the world four nights in, <laughs> <laughs> in Torquay. I never moved out yeah, the same yeah, town. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and uh, I had the clotted cream and the the, the clotted cream oh, and the jam on the scones. Beautiful. You know, I do like, I do love Torquay. Yeah. You know, but there's beautiful parts of the UK, you know, that are overlooked yeah. because people want to go to Future Venture and Fungarol and Marbella. And yeah. But there's some beautiful coast, coastal resorts in the UK. Same as there's some beautiful coastal resorts in Ireland. But they get overlooked yeah. because people want to go abroad yeah. for the sun and the cheap beer. Yeah. But I get enough sun and the sun better and I don't drink beer. <laughs> <laughs> no.
There's going to be two more questions, but there's a massive scope to each one, but I want you to try and, because with your knowledge, you could just blow this out of the water here now, but I want you to narrow it down. Favourite fighter? Nigel Penn was one of my favourite fighters, right? Even though I got beat by Steve Collins, because Nigel Penn was in some incredible fights. Oh, fuck, right? tell me. And I know there was a tragic ending to the McLennan fight. Sad ending. Yeah. But uh, when he even went out to New York, he went out to America, <laughs> and he beat Iron Barkley. Iron Barkley. Iron Barkley. Dog did wit. He never Iron, lost to an American, you know. Iron that. Barkley was just after beating, um, after beating, um, oh, one of the greatest of all time. Was the, it Duran? No, it was in the era with Duran. Um, there was uh, Tommy Hearns. Was yes, just after he beat just beat Hearns. Tommy Hearns. Hearns was on a roll. Yeah. And Aaron Barkley beat Stopped him. Stopped him. Aaron Barkley beat him. So he beat the man that was the man. Yeah. So the Nigel Ben went out into his back garden. And banged him out. Beat the man that was the man. Yeah. And just beat the man. You know, so anyone that understands boxing will know it was a brave thing for Nigel Ben to do. To go to another man's backyard when he was the champion. Yeah. And he never lost to a, a Yank. An it's incredible awkward. fighter, you know. So he, he'd be one of my favourite fighters. But one of my all-time idolised Muhammad Ali, Sean. I loved him. I just adored him. And I met him on four occasions. And he, would, to me, was a very special human being. Yeah. You know, as a Not boxer, just a fighter. As a boxer and as a fighter. So he'd be my all-time favourite Muhammad Ali. Nigel Ben would be probably like my fighting favourite. Yeah. But there's another great fighter that, that gets overlooked. Tragically, he, he went at a very, very young age, Arturo Gatti. What a... I knew Arturo and I knew his brother Joe. And um, wow. Arturo was in three, three great fights with Mickey Ward. Right? He's been in some great fights with he was, as well. He was, he was, he was um, the Atlantic City draw. When Atlantic City was, was alive with boxing, I fought in Atlantic City twice. I fought in the Sands Hotel and Casino in Atlantic City, and I fought in the Tropicana Hotel and Casino in Atlantic City. Atlantic City was alive with boxing at yeah. the time. And Vegas took over Atlantic City now. But Atlantic City, the boardwalk of Atlantic City, the hotels, it was incredible. And Arturo Gatti was the big draw in Atlantic City. He was in, in some incredible fights. But him and Mickey Ward had a trilogy, right? Now the first fight, like the Duran and Leonard fights, the first fight, Arturo Gatti stood and fought Mickey Ward. And Mickey Ward was the better fighter. Same as when Sheree Leonard, Sheree Leonard yeah. stood and fought with Roberto Duran. Duran was the better, better fighter. fighter. Yeah. The second fight, Ray Leonard went into the boxing. He skilled boxing. Yeah. And Duran, one of the greatest fighters of all time, quit. Can't get near him. No mass. Can't get near him. Well, in the second fight with Mickey Ward and Arturo Gatti, Arturo got a man called um, former world champion. Um, in his corner. Training him. Um, yeah. I'll tell you the champion's name. And he brought Arturo back to where he was a boxer. Mm. He said, listen, you cannot stand... And that was evident in the You cannot fight. stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mickey Ward, Arturo. Yeah. He said, he's too strong. We're going to go back to the basics of your boxing skills. And he took him back to the basics of his boxing skills. And he beat Mickey Ward in the second fight. Yeah. Then they had a third fight. And Arturo won the third fight. So he won two out of the three. But their trilogy, two great friends. Yeah, for now. Two great friends. Do you know how much they got paid for the first fight, Joe? No idea. 350 grand. For that fight. 350 grand. One of the, one of the greatest fights of all time. They got a million for the second fight because they knew what was going to happen after watching them. They got three million for the third. But I know they were both champions and the organisations they were champions for wouldn't sanction the fights. That's so they true. threw the belts away. Yeah. They said, we want to fight each other. We don't want to be sanctioned. We just want to fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The fighter that trained Arturo Gatti, mixed race champion, um, oh, Sean, let's go. No, no, it's, no. I'm, I'm, so I'm, look, I'm looking at him now in the corner. Former champion. Of Not Buddy McGirt. Buddy McGirt. Buddy McGirt. Buddy McGirt. Fair play to Sean, because that would have annoyed Buddy me. Buddy McGirt. Great right, Buddy McGirt. Yeah. You know. What a fighter himself. What a little fight. And do you know what? One of the nicest men in yeah. boxing. Most job. boxers are nice people, Sean. Yeah, one of the nicest you know. men in boxing, Buddy McGirt. What a gentleman. You know. 
But Joe, one message, two messages we can finish on. One, what would your message be to kids now? Struggling in life, looking for a way out or looking to get involved in crime or any bullshit behaviour. What would your message be? I wouldn't encourage anybody to get involved in crime, sure. Encourage them to I'd, get in. Yeah, would you? I would encourage... Where do you want to box? Where do you want to fight? Go down to the boxing gym and experience the camaraderie and the friendship of the boxing gym. Yeah. Because, um, like I said earlier on in this interview, if you can get into the boxing ring and spar, don't mind getting into the boxing ring and fight. If you can get into the boxing ring and spar, because anybody that tells you the punches don't hurt are telling lies. All the punches hurt. Tell lies. All the punches hurt. Some yeah. hurt more than others, but they all hurt. Now, if you can get into that boxing ring and spar, that's courage. Yeah. If you can get into the boxing ring and fight, that's even more courage. Yeah. But that will help you in life, because if you're going for an interview for a job, it shouldn't phase you because if you can climb into that boxing ring and spar and you can climb into that boxing ring and fight, going in for an interview and a job is, is tame. Yeah. You know, so that, that, that's one thing. It will give you the confidence to, to carry to it through life. To live life. To carry it through life, yes. Yeah. To carry it through life because it's very, very important to have confidence. And respect. Oh yeah, first and foremost. Yeah. Self-respect and respect for others. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd encourage people to go down to a, a boxing gym, now an M &M, MMA gym, or a, a kickboxing gym, or a karate gym, or a judo gym. Yeah. Get involved, yeah. you know. Learn the fundamentals of the sports, and compete. If you've yeah. got the courage to compete, compete. Win, lose, or draw, the fact that you've had a go. Yeah, is all that matters. That's yeah. all that matters. Final message, John Fury. Des was talking about courage. Yes. John. John. Coincidence. John. John. You talk the talk. Have the courage to walk the walk, John. Get in and fight me. You know, get into the boxing ring and let's have a good tear up. The best man will win on the night. I'm hoping it's me. And at this stage of our lives, at this stage of our lives, it gives us something to look forward to, having a good tear up in the boxing ring, John. You talk about going into your barn. I want to do it in a boxing ring, John. So, come on, let's get it on. Big Joe. Sure. My Absolute brother. Pleasure. Absolute My brother. Pleasure as always. Love it. Love it. Love it.